job today, folks. Of, uh... oh. Sorry. That's it. You're okay to, now. We have to accept that. Hang on. Here we go. There we go. That's better. Um, I've got a bit of interference. Hopefully, it's not too bad for other people. But um, yeah, Keith Trials. I'm the co creation delivery manager for Angling Water. Um, I actually work for Keir on the Keir Clancy and Anglian Alliance, um, operations manager for Keir, but my Anglian role is co-creation delivery. Um, to explain a bit more about that, um, well, if you wanna just flick to the next slide, um, very fancy title, I know, but effectively that, that, that's a, a bit of a license as the bullet points there say, working with end users and all stakeholders, uh, Pan Alliance approach, uh, we work with all supply chain, as you'll see today uh, with Will from R2M, um, I get involved in lots of innovation um, and we have a, a, a very privileged, there's a small team within Anglian that I lead, there's only three of us, um, but we have a, a high level support so we, we have the ability to try things out um, very quickly uh, with, with, with commercial support and high business level support. The other bit to co-creation is that there is, we have a capital programme, um, so at the minute for example I'm delivering 10 kilometres of main lane in Wisbeach uh, over in Cambridge. Uh, and what that does, the capital program gives us the, the playground, for want of a better description, to try out a lot of the new, new products, devices, innovation, that kind of stuff. It gives us the playground for development um, all under one house. So really that, that sort of facilitates, facilitates that whole speed of movement. Um, so that's kind of what co-creation is all about. Um, to try and make that a little bit clearer, Will, if you can just flip to the next slide. We've just got two slides very quickly before I hand over to Will with some examples of some of the stuff we've done in the last 18 months. So uh, top left-hand corner there, you've got a blue uh, hydrant encapsulation uh, collar. Uh, they're 3D printed um, and they're, they're, um, they're fixed to hydrants to prevent the tops blowing off. There's, just, there's quite a bit of explanation re required around that. And perhaps something else I said, Dave, I can come along to another uh, committee meeting and go through in detail. Um, but you've got uh, the middle picture there is the, is the booster, which Will's gonna talk about shortly when I hand over. Um, you've got another picture down the bottom right hand corner with some very funky looking sort of IMR colored um, long handle tools. Um, and that's something we're also working with with R2M to develop. Um, and those will facilitate us or give us the ability or the teams rather the ability to conduct service repairs from above ground without getting into the excavation. Uh, so the couple of things you can see there is a long handled squeeze off and a long handled cutter. Uh, and if you can think about the implications of that, you know, with the team sort of uh, currently they'll be bent over in a small excavation with a, with a pair of hand cutters and wet knees and wet feet and all the rest of the stuff where with this tooling we're developing they can actually conduct repairs from above ground just standing above the excavation um, and that also facilitates other things like smaller excavation sizes those kinds of things so there's just a few examples there I think we've got a few more on the next slide Will uh, again yeah on the far left hand side there you can see some long handle tooling being used to carry out a water connection so uh, last November, we were the first UK water company to conduct a full service connection on a potable water system from above ground without an operator entering the excavation at all. So that particular one, we did um, core, and vac, used core and vac technology taken from the gas industry, um, developed that with uh, another contract partner, TT UK. Um, and last November at Creating was the first successful connection. So again, same kind of principle. This is the guys been able to do their work without getting into excavations in keyhole excavations at very small holes. Um, we've applied that to different applications. So the central one there you can see with a tiny little um, uh, vacuum that anyone that's got children looks like Nunu from the Teletubbies, they'll, they'll know very well, but it's a, a very small uh, excavator on tracks. Um, you can see it's got a solid extension hose there. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see a, a BT utility we've exposed. So what we're doing with that, it's taken some current technology, but applying it differently. So traditionally you would have had to, to find the utilities prior to doing, for example, some directional drilling or bursting or whatever it might be. You have to expose all the utilities you cross. Um, traditionally that would be a trial hole. So we're digging up the footpath, digging up the carriageway. Uh, what we're doing with the air vac pilot holes is where, as you can see, very small four inch core uh, vacuum ex excavating down to the utility to expose it. So we get depth and type of utility. So we're, we're, we're confirming our utility plans effectively before we start work. Um, that's tied in with GPR as well, uh, ground penetrating radar. So we get accurate locations of utility. So we completely map. Uh, this, was, this was one of my schemes at Wisbeach, I, I mentioned earlier. Um, 
And, and we're, we're able to do that whole process, one operator in about 20, 30 minutes, also replace the core that we extract in the footpath or carriageway. Um, so if, if you think about what a traditional footpath uh, trial hill would cost, uh, our date is about £280 for a small excavation. Um, that includes the blacktop team going back the next day to reinstate and everything else. Carriageway, it's about nearly 400. Um, are able to do these air vac pilot holes for li literally uh, half an hour time of an operator uh, and a small amount of resin to replace the core. Um, so it's things like that. So it's a very, very quick sort of touch on what co-creation does within Anglian Water. As I say, we work with various business units. We're, we're not tied to the IMR, even though we're sort of supported and sponsored by the IMR. Um, and lots of um, lots of stakeholders, external supply chain, R2M being one. Um, and yeah, we're pretty much involved in everything. So it's a very privileged role. Um, but, but myself, uh, historically, I've been involved with Anglian for almost 30 years now. Um, on the operational delivery side, I used to have sort of 150 people looking, looking after me, underneath me. Um, I've been kind of taken off the hamster wheel, uh, given, given a very small team, so we can really focus on concentrating on areas for improvement of the business. Um, so there's just a few examples there of some of the stuff we've done in the last 18 months. Um, some of it fairly groundbreaking. Um, but the main event for today really is, 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 the, is the booster. Um, so again, this has been a collaboration working with R2M, Will of R2M. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Will in a second to take you through the booster and, and what, we've done, what we've done with that and the fact that's now out in the field, real life application. Um, depending on how we get on with time, I mean, Dave, you'll probably say at the end, if, if anybody wants to whip back and ask a few questions in relation to a few of those examples I've given, that's absolutely fine. Or as I said, I'm happy to put a bit more content together for people that are genuinely interested in, uh, in, yeah. in, in, yeah, in co-creation in a yeah, bit more depth. Speakers turned on, so. Oh, we've got something going on there. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that's very, very that quick. I, yeah. I don't want to detract from the main event of today, my, my colleague will, um, but it I'm trying to give you a brief that. overview of co-creation. Oh, that works. I, this apparently doesn't. We've got, we've got some interference there, I think. I yeah, I can't about. understand where that's coming from because no one's. Oh, we've got somebody with that, uh, ah. the Peter Blair, is it with that a mute on? Yeah. Like, um, yeah, so hopefully, guys, that's a very brief overview of, 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 of what co creation does, how we've got involved with R2M. As I say, this is angling, reaching out to various supply chain, various stakeholders, but all with a view to business improvement. Uh, in, in however that comes, uh, productivity, cost savings, innovation, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Will. And as I said, if you've got any questions at the end, more than happy to take those. Okay, Will, um, over to you, mate. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Will from R2M. Um, let's go over to my slides now. Here we go. I was logging up for a second then. Okay, laser boost, booster, solar powered, um, single property pressure booster. Um, broad statement, every water company's got low pressure problems, customers with low pressure. And if it's below 1.5 bar and nine and a half litres a minute, goes on the DG2 register. And I think there are penalties, fines and, and whatever. There's a reason why we don't want people on that register. Um, could just be that house is the furthest away. It could be impacted by infill development. Um, elevation is a big problem, of course, because pressure versus elevation is always a battle. For every 10 meters up you are, you lose a bar in pressure. Um, typical solution is lay a pipe, bigger pipe. But that can be highly cost prohibitive for, for a single customer, obviously. You could be talking about 80 odd grand to lay that pipe for that house there. It's just not. There's got to be other ways of doing it to get them their water. Another solution is to pump it up. But again, that's highly cost prohibitive because pressure um, and pumping is exponential. You go from four bar to five bar, it's not 20% more energy, more like 80% more energy. So pumping it up at a higher um, rate is expensive to do. And then of course, this tends to happen. So. There's a lot in it for all of you to have your DMAs at as low a pressure as you can have and still give the customers the pressures that they're, they're entitled to. Okay, you can use a, a mains powered remote booster like this one, um, but getting the energy to them is expensive. And you probably know that this little lot here is probably four or 5,000 pounds worth. 
but that cable coming into it there could be, well, we looked at three and they were 85 to 110 grand just to get the electricity into this to boost, to, to get to that pump and boost the power. So mains power is often really cost prohibitive. So renewable is obvious solution. We all said, yeah, solar panels, wind turbines, easy, we can do that. Like you always do when you think you've had an idea. Um, so we'd, we'd use a booster pump, just like we always had. Um, so we decided we'll form this collaboration that was that, that this is um, co-creation. Um, and the four companies got together and um, we said, look, the solar farm will do this. One of these blocks on its own will be absolutely loads of energy. But of course, you just can't have the space. So we looked at wind power. We drew this with these vertical turbines and we decided against that because they lose all their efficiency when they're close to the ground. And there's a worry about leads jamming them up and, and stopping them functioning. So we went away from that idea pretty quick. And then we looked at just solar. So let's cover our, our cabinet with solar panels. And it was decided that was, that was the way we would go. So we built a rough prototype. Let's try it out. And we started to look at the solar yield. Now, this is in January um, of, of this year. So not that long ago. And some started to add up and we were thinking, you know, I didn't think you would get enough energy in those panels to run a pump, but it looked like we were. We'd need battery storage, obviously, for the, the nighttime demand because the sun doesn't shine at night usually. <laughs> and we'd have to control the charge coming in and charging the batteries and discharging the batteries in quite a sophisticated way. So we knew we had that challenge to look after. Um, we decided on lithium polymer batteries and lead acid batteries because um, lithium polymer doesn't accept a charge at very, very low temperature. So in the depths of winter, you could end up with good sunlight on your panels, but your batteries won't receive the charge because it's too low a temperature for them. So having a separate bank of lead acid uh, covers that. Okay, so it, it, was, it was starting to take shape at this point. Um, the new cabinet was, was made and the the off-the-shelf components were all compiled. We wanted to use as many off-the-shelf components as we could because there, there was a, obviously a legacy of reliability behind them that we could, you know, we could, look, we could use. The cabinet obviously needed some ventilation. We needed to fare in the cables. We can't have cables on display anywhere. So we, we designed all of that. And there was the first one, shiny stainless steel being produced. There's some... Um, that's one of the incarnations of how we ended up wiring it. And these charge controllers along here, they take care of the fact that some of these panels are always in the shade and pointing north. If you've got panels on the roof of your house, you'll probably only have one of these charge controllers. But if a big leaf or a branch overhangs one of those panels, it brings all the other panels down to the efficiency of the lowest performing panel. So we've got five different separate banks of panels here. So um, we, don't, we don't confine ourselves to the lowest performing panel or bank of panel. Okay, so starting to take shape there. Interestingly enough, these batteries were being charged from the ambient light in the office. Um, they, we never charged, the whole seven kilowatt hours of batteries were never charged through the mains. They, they, their entire initial charge came from the solar energy being generated by the, by the cabinet. Okay, there's me, looking like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so unit number one's ready at this point, and I think we're in April now. So we have 700 watts of capacity, but that's not realistic because this box, the sun doesn't go 360 degrees around this individual cabinet. So, it's really more like 400. You're always going to have four of these facing the sun. And bear in mind, these are the modern, flexible, monocrystalline panels. So they don't need to be at exactly 30 degrees of elevation. But they are actually pointing to the sun even when they're vertical or completely horizontal. Okay, we're at about seven kilowatt hours of battery storage. I'll show you about a box and, and come to that in a minute. Um, we also had a DC pump. Sorry, the DC system is being inverted to 240 volts 
which is going to use energy, but that meant we could use a standard Grunfoss pump like this, which we all, we know when we travel. Um, we've got a, a more efficient, decent pump on the way, but that's that's stuff in approval at the moment, so that, that might be later than we said, because originally we said the autumn, and uh, I think we're almost almost past the autumn now. So. Okay, so the first unit is suitable for low water consumption. Uh, you know, any customer on the register, really. Um, um, but this cabinet can be um, used to harvest energy for all sorts of, of things, you know, all sorts of applications. Okay, so now we're fast forwarding to 23rd of April. And bear in mind, we'd only started in the autumn preview for this. Um, there's the cabinet, it's completely self contained. At five o'clock on the first day when we put it together on site, because we, we sub-assembled it and then reassembled it on site, it was generating 200 watt hours. So we already felt we had a surplus. Um, the pump switched itself on and off via its own management system. We had to trick that because at the time there was 5.2 bar coming in. So there was enough to get up to the top of the hill to the, the actual uh, customer's point. Um, so we were having to trick it on and off, but we knew the energy was coming in as, as, as we wanted it to. And at the, that point, they intended to turn that entire zone down by 1.1 bar. So that was going to save a fortune in energy and in burns to well. So, you know, we, we didn't know the savings. They can be calculated, but they're going to be significant. So there's also pictures during the installation. Interestingly enough, um, this panel here is facing the traffic because there's a it's a it's a 90 degree bend where that is, and uh, we're going to do a bit of analysis to see do we get any solar energy yield or any light energy yield from the car headlights coming in that direction because they come straight at it and then turn around the corner. <laughs> That's going to be interesting because let's say if you only get a couple of watts out of each car coming past, um, you know, if it's 100 cars, that's a worthwhile amount of energy. So. We'll be looking at that. Okay, now fast forward to September. So that's this September. Um, you can see the grass has grown around it a bit more. We had a leak on it to start with, so I think the grass around here grew a, a bit faster than the rest of it did in that field. Um, right, there's your customer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is very, very sensible for a new thing like this to be tried somewhere that doesn't impact a family that needs the shower and need everything you know this is an agricultural installation that trough of you know is going to be filled whether it's filled at nine and a half liters a minute and one and a half bar or not it's still going to trickle and fill so it was a very very sensible place to start you know an agricultural you know some animal troughs and drinking troughs like this but i mean bear in mind it's important say that that genuinely was our first customer will wasn't it yeah, he's the one who even came over that one, just, but it wasn't just him, of course. It was a multi occupancy um, supply point there. So. Um, okay, so the zone at this point had been turned down by about 1.3 to 1.5 bars. We then had about four bar coming in, and that meant there was only a trickle, an absolute trickle, and this, this wasn't full at the time. So we then we teased the um, pump settings upwards because it has a, a various settings. Um, until we got to the point where we were boosting to one to 5.2 down the hill, which was giving the supply point 1.2 to 1.5 bar and 11, I think 11 litres a minute. And this is this, you know, this is right next to that trough. So, you know, this can't really lie. The pressure gauge can't really be wrong. And we did lots of playing around with the flow cup. So we're, we're confident we were giving that supply point at statutory minimum. Okay, so we... We're tracking the energy that's coming into it. Um, and we get a breakdown per bank of panels. In May, we were getting 329 watt hours in a 24 hour period, but there was only four panels connected. When we went back in June and we had, we'd already connected the rest then, we were getting 560. And this is the breakdown here. So it gives you each day. So looking back, we can tell you exactly when the dull days and the, shut, the, the sunny days were in June and July. Um, yeah, July 598. And I think there is a mistake here because there's, a, there's two thirtieths in this report. So I downloaded too many days. And I could imagine we were there on the 30th of 
of July because we only had 130 watt hours coming in, which would suggest we were there at 10 o'clock in the morning. And that was why all the other days were up in you know, threes, fours, and five hundreds. But still, 598 watt hours is, is a decent amount of energy coming in. <laughs> August was 550, so it started to drop because the days started to get a bit shorter. We all look outside and see that the, the nights are drawing in, as, as Mother used to say. But 552 watts is, is still a decent amount of energy. Um, there's the breakdown again. And I was on holiday for half of August, and, and I didn't think the sun shone at all the two weeks I was off. Sure. <laughs> um, a little piece of trivia here 500 watt hours, or half a kilowatt, is enough to push a Tesla about 1.75 miles. If anybody watching has got a, an electric car, you'll know you get about three and a half to four miles per kilowatt hour. So if you imagine pushing a great heavy Tesla, you know, a Model S, which weighs nearly two tons, 1.75 miles, that's what you'd be able to do with what our cabinet generated on that day, you know, in a, any day during August. So that puts it in perspective. Okay, so obviously we've got a winter coming. December is about 50% of the daylight of June. So on paper, we think we're going to be creating about 280 watt hours in the darkest months. The pump is using 80 to 100 watts. So if you continuously pump for an hour, you get 700 liters pushed out of that supply point and use, say, 100 watt, 100 watt hours. So we still should have some surplus. Now, the battery storage, we reckon, is enough to cope with 50 days of total darkness. So if you're under complete solar eclipse for 50 days, this thing should still do its job. Um, obviously, at the end of that 50 days, you have a completely flat battery and the sun to come out and be pretty strong, but you know, that's a scenario that probably won't ever happen, we, we hope. So losses in, in winter, we know there's going to be some, but photovoltaic panels, they convert light, they don't convert, you know, heat isn't, isn't really a thing. If anything, heat hurts them because it makes them expand and then the, the wafers, those black sort of lines you see are silicon wafers, and a photon comes in from the sun that way and comes out the other end as an electron, and that's how they work. If they get further apart, they get less efficient. So if they expand because they're too hot, they're not actually as good. But the light intensity in the winter is lower. And we don't really know what that will represent here. At this point, we, we, we decided not to listen to experts because they told us not to bother with the panels on the back. And, you know, I've shown them. The panel on the back were giving us enough energy to run the inverting system. Right, lithium batteries, they don't accept charge well in the cold and they don't perform as well. Um, you know, um, it's just like all, all batteries, and we know this from our electric cars. And um, yesterday, our car said it had 145 miles in the battery, whereas in June, we got 210 miles out of it one day. So we know the temperature affects batteries, and that's why I'm saying seven kilowatt hours in those batteries, total capacity in the winter that may or be five kilowatt hours. Okay, we can charge at low temperature because we've got the lead acid carbon, so that, that covers that. But the safety margin overall, we still think, you know, we're gonna be okay even if we've got 30% of what we, we forecast coming in, which we should be okay. So. We're only using 100 watt hours a day. You know, we should be we should be fine, and we're looking forward to getting through the winter and getting through to February when the daylight starts yeah. to increase again. Now we're making three more unit, units, similar agricultural uh, usage, similar to this one, um, and they're going to be better. They're going to be smaller. I think I can show you. Yeah, the cabinet's going to be a little bit smaller where we've we've taken away any wasted space. <coughs> if it's green and not got a panel on it, it's not really doing anything for us. So we've made them a little bit smaller. Um, it's got a lifting, lifting eyes on it now as well, because the last one we sub-assembled it on site. We don't want to be doing that. We want to be plonking it on site, connecting the pipes up, and then switching the on button on, and it will spring into light. Okay, so. We did a bit of work to shield. We were worried because there is wet here. This is a pump with water in it. We want to keep that away from the electrical parts. So we've shielded that all off properly. 
Um, you can see it's about six percent smaller. Six percent smaller. And also, we've only got one lock now because the locks were a very expensive type of padlock. So there's only one now. But the doors are immensely strong. If you you would get into that if you had a long enough crowbar, but you'd wreck it in the process. Okay, so it's ready for, for low water consumption applications. We think about 700 litres a day at the moment, and that could depend on a great number of things. But it's got to be in a, a shade-free area. You know, there's no point putting it in the woods because it just won't work. Um, and not a vandalism risk area. It, it looks fairly plain, you know, it's got solar panels on a green cabinet, but if somebody knew there were expensive batteries in there, they might be tempted to um, break into it. Um, we'd also want to start with a positive pressure situation. So sit it somewhere where it's got pressure and it's boosting it up the hill, boosting it up a lot. We, it will pull a vacuum, but we've got no idea of what the implications for energy consumption are, so we want to avoid that. And of course, it'd be a, a collaboration and information sharing basis. So, you know, it's still an experimental product. It didn't exist in its, you know, in the format that we installed in April until like, two weeks earlier than that. So it's very, very new. It would have to be an, on a collaborative basis. And I think uh, I'm at the end now. So. 18 minutes, two minutes over, sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks very much for that, Will. Um, we're now in a position to uh, open out to questions. I'll just stop the recording now.